This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Here is another Beyond the Big Screen teaser for episodes coming soon. I hope you enjoy and definitely tune in for the full episodes. If you want to learn more, you can head over to beyondthebigscreen.com. You can support Beyond the Big Screen on Patreon and Subscribestar. By joining on Patreon and or Subscribestar, you can help keep Beyond the Big Screen going and get many great benefits. Benefits include advertisement-free content, bonus content, and early access. The bonus content is great, too. I will feature outtakes from episodes and live streaming episodes. If you join at the executive producer level, you will become just that, an executive producer of Beyond the Big Screen. You will be able to develop ideas for upcoming episodes, help find great guests, and of course have your name mentioned at the beginning or end of each episode. You won't just be a supporter, you will be a critical member of the team. Go over to patreon.com forward slash beyond the big screen or subscribestar.com forward slash beyond the big screen to learn more. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com or follow us on social media by searching for A2Z History. I will see you next time beyond the big screen. Here are some outtakes from episodes of Beyond the Big Screen. Today we feature international spies and scientists. I think that that's something that comes across with with Philby and with uh, with McLean and even Fuchs th- that we've talked about and some of the other people that you've written about is that class differential in Great Britain that there really was a really top loaded at the the high end this aristocracy group and the the poor really were destitute. Yes, yeah. The, uh, the income differentials, the wealth differentials are not all that different from today in the United States. It's that um, the poverty in this country is disguised and it is complicated by the racial factor. So we have uh, the very poorest people are, are black and, people, and they're just kind of not thought of in those terms. Uh, in Britain, everybody was white. It's still rather striking. If you go anywhere in England outside of London, everyone's white. It's <laughs> odd for an American. Uh, McLean, Philby, Burgess, Blunt, those five, uh, uh, Karen Cross, saw this enormous poverty and they thought that it was wrong. And they thought something had to be done about it. And the only group that was consistently saying that something could be done about it was the Communist Party. It's quite important to uh, remember that these people were interested in the situation in Britain. And when they joined (coughs) the Communist Party or they became associated with it, they weren't thinking about the Soviet Union. They were thinking about how to make things better for the majority of people in Great Britain. How do you compare somebody like Klaus Fuchs to some of the other scientists, especially some of the scientists like the Nazi scientists who were the after World War II, the Americans and the Russian Soviet Russians and the British? They're all trying to gobble up these scientists and bring them to their side. Somebody like Werner von Braun, how would you compare the von Braun was a Nazi till the bitter end and then he becomes an American and he creates the basically the entire space program. Do you think that ethic, ethically there's something different between somebody like von Braun as, and somebody like Fuchs? The German scientists is, is, is another story. There, there were German uh, nuclear physicists, uh, obviously, because nuclear physics was essentially a German thing. And the leading uh, German nuclear physicist was Heisenberg. And Heisenberg became head of the German atom bomb project. They uh, 
after the war, Heisenberg and his friends said, oh, well, we, we weren't really working on an atomic bomb. We were just pretending that we were. But they were really working on the atomic bomb. Uh, they didn't have a Fuchs telling them to, to use the red wire, not the blue wire. They were kind of muddling along on their own. And it, crucially, they didn't have enough money. Uh, the, the Manhattan Project worked because, uh, uh, as uh, they were told, uh, they were, uh, the Americans were told by uh, Niels Bohr that in order to produce an atom bomb, you'd have to turn the entire country into a factory, which essentially is what they did. The Manhattan Project was bigger than Detroit. The Germans just didn't have that money. But the German scientists uh, felt, let's say, to give them the benefit of their doubt, the inverse of what Fuchs did. The German scientists who were working on the atomic bomb project thought that their loyalty to the country, or in this case to Hitler, trumped their loyalty to their ideals. And so they had to uh, do that kind of work. And I suppose that uh, von Braun would have said the same thing. These are two strands of, of German culture, uh, 19th century, early 20th century German culture. On the one hand, you had the loyalty to the country, to the government, to the leader, whether it was Kaiser Wilhelm or uh, Adolf Hitler. And the, um, the generals, for example, the German generals swore allegiance to Hitler personally. Then on the other hand, you had uh, what was called the confessional church, the Protestant church in Germany, which was characterized as I went on perhaps too long earlier by these Lutheran and Kantian uh, ideals that you saw the inner light, uh, you prayed or you thought, depending on which side of that you were on, uh, for a long time, you decided what was right and you followed that. That was what happened. They said uh, the foreign office, the head of personnel for the foreign office, who was a friend of his, of course he was a friend of his, uh, said, well, you need uh, Don, you need some, Donald, you need some, uh, some help. And we'll, we'll send you to one of the foreign office. We have these very discreet psychiatrists. And you can talk to them about your uh, alcoholism. And Donald McLean said, uh, I'd rather not talk to one of the foreign office psychiatrists. I know one myself, and I'll have her to talk to. And so his friend, the head of personnel, said, oh, of course, sure, Don. Anything you want. So he uh, had therapy with a Jungian Danish psychiatrist in London for six months. Four, six. Melinda, meanwhile, had gone with, with her mother, with the Ottoman aristocrat of Spain. Um, how people lived. When uh, Donald McLean uh, felt better, he said, come, come back, we'll, we'll, we'll get together again. Uh, I'll stop having sex with men or women to the nail without having sex. And uh, I'll drink less. So she said, I'll give you one more time. One more chance. She went to London. She immediately got pregnant, so I guess it worked. And uh, Don McLean's friend, the head of personnel, said, I see you're all patched up. Um, he was high enough up. He was a member of the Soviet Communist Party. Now, he was high enough up in it that uh, he was able to see the head of the KGB when he wanted to. This is in contrast to Philby, who was kind of put off to one side and told that he was important, but wasn't. McLean was very important. I talked to one of McLean's protégés. Right. I emailed, but didn't talk to him. I had uh, a reasonable amount of uh, correspondence with one of his protégés who talked about uh, what a wonderful guy McLean was, how he had, was very helpful with younger scholars, and that at certain crucial points, he was able to uh, help people who had gotten in trouble as dissidents. Uh, yeah, uh, he'd go. He'd go to the KGB uh, generals or to the head of the KGB and said and say, you know, that girl's okay. You don't have to put her in a psychiatric hospital. He was for, uh, he, on the one hand, he he had contact with Sakharov. On the other hand, he had contact with Ermakov, who was the prime minister of Soviet Union. Had a very fulfilling career. Wrote articles. For a book called British Foreign Policy After Suez.
really Marie Curie and Einstein, they're kind of the biggest personalities in, in many respects to this conference. Who was maybe another person who really sh- struck you or who grabbed your interest, who participated? You know, it's interesting. So, so Marie Curie and Einstein are certainly the big names, but when you take a look at Paul Langvin, who was her lover at the time of the 1911 conference, he, uh, in his own right, was thought to be potentially the next big scientist uh, from France related to physics. Um, he ended up uh, becoming a uh, moderator of the conferences in the years after Heinrich Lorentz uh, passed away. He Lorentz passed away in the 20s, and so um uh, Langvin uh, became the moderator of the conferences but he he was a, a unique uh, individual and certainly worthy of a relationship with Marie Curie as she was worthy of one with him and it was so unfortunate that that they ended up parting but um others include people like uh, Walter Nernst um who worked with Save to set up this conference I I say in the book um this was basically Nert's conference, he came to Salve and it, it was his brainchild to say, let's put a conference together for this elite group of people and let's, um, let's support them financially. Um, Salve, you're uh, more than able to do that. Let's bring them together so that they don't have financial worries. They can get together and uh, talk uh, physics and, and look at problems to solve. So he wanted to do this because he was very ambitious himself. He wanted a Nobel Prize. Um, he saw that this was an honor that was um, unique in the scientific world. Um, and he felt that his own work in uh, low temperature studies related to a quantum theory was something that might be worthy of a Nobel Prize if um, quantum theory was legitimized at this conference. And so, um, he wanted these great minds to get together and talk about quantum, quantum theory in a manner that would accept and support it uh, to lay the groundwork for his own thoughts related to um, getting a, a Nobel Prize. Um, another individual is um, Ernest Rutherford, who was um, rather than a partner with the Curies, he was more a rival with the Curies in discovering and investigating phenomena related to radioactivity in the early 1900s, from 1900 to about 1910. Marie Curie, by 1911, was thought to be the expert on radioactivity. But if there was a 1A to Marie Curie's being number one, it was Ernest Rutherford. And By that time, when they got together at the conferences, rather than being rivals, they were more friendly supporters of each other and of the theories related to radioactivity. Because by that time, much had been discovered and published, and they both had received um, Nobel Prizes, Curie in 1903, Rutherford in 1908, for their work on radioactivity. So the rivalry wasn't really as strong. But Rutherford was a major uh, scientific uh, force. Uh, he, he went on to lead the Cavendish Labs in um, Cambridge and uh, was well known through that time period for being a, uh, a, a just a brilliant individual related to subatomic um, machinations in the in the world and an investigation of those. So. Individuals like that, I, I mentioned uh, Heinrich Lorentz as well, were, um, were people who were well known. The ones that stand out, of course, are Einstein and, and, uh, and Curie. But uh, it's interesting, Einstein's first marriage to uh, someone I had mentioned earlier, um, Maleva marriage, was one that might have been uh, uh, similar to um, Marie and, and Pierre Curie in terms of being the Swiss version of the French Curies. Um, they, Einstein and Marich were both uh, uh, well thought of um, scientifically, although 
um, merits not on the level of Einstein. And instead of Einstein embracing that relationship and working with her um, as a partner, he basically, once they got married, reverted to her being a, a uh, wife and housekeeper and cook and eventual mother of his two boys. And he didn't support her the way she yearned to be supported. And um, that potential for them to be uh, the Swiss version of the Curies never came to pass. And it, it was crushing for Maleva because she felt that she had something to offer as well, a sci an astute scientific mind and uh, someone who wanted to desperately um, pair with Einstein scientifically as well as personally, but that never came to be. In your bio, it um, on the back of the book, this really struck me. It said how you have an exceptional eye for overlooked historical gems in history. And I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. What are maybe some other gems that you have in mind to expand on in the future? You know, um, you know, when we talk about historical gems, my view of that is it's really the juxtaposition of individuals and events that you wouldn't normally think of when you think of history. So I wouldn't normally have thought of Einstein and Curie together, except for the exposure I had in my Salve days to um, a photo of the 1927 uh, Salve Conference on Physics, which is called, by the way, the most intelligent picture ever taken. Why? Because 17 of the 29 people in that picture um, received or were about to receive Nobel Prizes. So I saw these two people, Curie and, and Einstein, and I, I wondered, what is this conference all about? And I started to research it. And what was the first of these conferences, if this was the fifth one? And I, I found this story, which really I believe is a uh, sort of uh, an, uh, you know, a, a gem, if you will, um, that's been overlooked. And it's those types of things which make for, I think, great historical writing. Um, so I, I think one might be um, something that's intrigued me um, is uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, meeting with Upton Sinclair. So these are um, a giant in politics, Teddy Roosevelt, Upton Sinclair, a giant in, in uh, uh, literature, um, meeting in 1904 when um, Upton Sinclair had written uh, uh, The Jungle about the uh, mistreatment of laborers in uh, the meatpacking industry and how Teddy Roosevelt at that time was looking to break the the big uh, trusts and monopolies in industry and the meatpacking industry was one that he wanted to take on. And so this unusual meeting of these two, um, they actually met in the White House to discuss um, the book, The Jungle that Upton Sinclair had written about the meatpacking industry. And they ended up um, both supporting um, a radical change in how uh, the country viewed uh, it's food supply. The FDA was formed at that time, those types of things. And the meatpacking industry was broken up as part of a, a trust busting type of effort that um, Roosevelt was uh, working through uh, at that time. So here's a, a juxtaposition of unlikely characters, both well known in their own right, who meet and not many people know about that. Um, and the key is not their meeting. The key is what transpired through that meeting in society. What transpired in 1911 was the beginning of the quantum revolution. Quantum theory was debated dramatically and vociferously over the next 20 years um, and, and ignited by that meeting uh, of people who understood subatomic uh, properties versus the larger universe. 
here's Roosevelt and Upton Sinclair getting together related to a, a meeting that talked about bigger things to happen, um, a change in the way government protected its citizens from monopolistic type of uh, approaches, whether it be the meatpacking industry or the oil industry or, or, or whatever. And at the same time, um, laws being put in place that were beneficial in other ways, the creation of the FDA and um, laws that would uh, work on pharmaceuticals and, and drugs to make them purer and more um, uh, helpful to society. So the meetings themselves are, are interesting, but it's what came from those meetings that to me um, makes the, the situation that much more interesting and worthy of, uh, of writing a book or, a, or having a movie.